Okay, I now want to talk about coordinate transforms. Um, and a coordinate transform is a way to modify the internal behavior of a state space model while leaving its external behavior unchanged. And so, well, what do I mean by that? Well, a state space model goes from inputs to outputs, but on the way you go through this intermediate internal variable x, which is the system state. Um, but that never appears in the output. And in fact, the choice of state is not unique. We can come up with other choices of the state, and maybe certain choices have certain advantages in um, certain situations. And that's really what we're talking about. We're going to talk about coordinate transformations in terms of the state x, which might have certain beneficial properties. Um, but a key point here is that this will not affect the system, the input-output system. The input-output system will be the same. It will have the same poles, it will have the same input-output response, it's got the same zeros, it's kind of got the same everything. We've just got a different choice of state vector. So what does this choice let us do? Well, it lets us manipulate the matrices A, B, C, and D. So what we can do is we can pick a new state that's related to the original state, and there are some restrictions on how we can do that, which we're going to talk about. But in the, these new coordinates, the state space model might have A, B, C, and D matrices with nicer structure in them. And we already saw an example of that, actually. Uh, we saw this controllable canonical form, and that was an example precisely of this. By making a particular choice of state variable, we can do this in such a way that the system matrices take highly structured forms which might illustrate um, certain features. So in that case, we were able to clearly relate a state space model to its transfer function rep uh, representation. So we're sure that with every state space model, there is a transfer function. We just don't know what it is. But if you put things in, um, you don't see clearly what it is. But if you put things in controllable canonical form, it's very clear what it is. Uh, you just read the denominator polynomial coefficients from the first row of the A matrix in the state space canonical form. And the coefficients for the numerator polynomial, they were just in the the C matrix in this particular set of coordinates. And we didn't explicitly show um, that this did correspond to a coordinate transform, but you can actually intuitively work out that it must be a coordinate transformation. Um, clearly, the controllable canonical form transfer fun uh, model was the same as the original one. Um, so every original model has a is a polynomial when written in terms of its inputs and outputs. And every polynomial can be put into controllable canonical form. So whatever the polynomial associated with this model, the ratio of polynomials associated with this model is, is controllable canonical form. You just read off whatever those polynomials are, or entries are, and put them in the right place. And the A matrix that you get is of the same size that you started with. And the input-output behavior is the same. Uh, so it's the same object. Um, so therefore, the state space models must be equivalent, and they are equivalent in the sense that one is just a coordinate transform of the other. So we're going to talk about what it means to be a coordinate transformation, and then we're going to see another example of a convenient coordinate transformation, and we're going to relate it to uh, the idea of partial fraction expansions. And what we'll actually see is a way to do partial fraction exp uh, partial fraction expansion using um, state space techniques, which actually correspond to linear algebra techniques, which means we can easily do them on the computer. So what we're essentially deriving today is a way to do partial fraction expansions with a computer. So you need never go through the tedious heavy side cover up method or whatever method you use for partial fractions. Again, you just hand it over to a computer and get it to do it for you. Um, which is what a lot of engineering is all about. So there's a kind of very long-winded introduction. Here's the state space model, and now we want to introduce a new coordinate. And there's no standard notation for this. Um, maybe a common choice is to call our new state coordinate Z. Doesn't matter. We could call it whatever we want. Be a bit confusing to just call it X, um, but well, anything else will do. And 
what are the rules? Well, z depends on x, and yeah, to keep everything linear, we're just going to put a matrix T in here. And this is a square matrix. So it's square matrix, and it's invertible. So T inverse exists. And those are the rules for uh, what constitutes a valid um, state transformation. We can pick any matrix we like, T, create a new variable Z that's related to X through Z is equal to TX, and then rewrite everything in these new coordinates. And now we'll now just show how to do that. Um, so in particular, so if we have this, then we also get that D by DT of Z is equal to t times t d by dt of x. So if we just differentiate this equation, we get this equation. And because t is invertible, we get that, that x is equal to t to the minus 1 times z. And now we just substitute things in. So the first thing that we're going to do is um, multiply this top equation by t. And so what do we get if we do that? Well, we get t x dot is equal to t a x plus t b u. And if we just uh, rearrange this, so t x dot, that's z dot. And that's equal to t a. And then x is equal to t inverse times z. And then this is just plus t b u. And if we do the same for y, we get that y is equal to c t to the minus 1 z plus d u. And we've ended up with another model, and it's in state space form, but just with modified a, b, c, and d matrices. So this is like a, oh, let's not use that. Um, so this is like a new, like a bar, b bar. C bar, and the, the D matrix is left unchanged. Um, so the result of applying our coordinate transformation is we get another state space model. It's just that the A, B, and C matrices have all been modified by whatever matrix T we choose uh, for our coordinate transformation. And so we can now take advantage of this to make certain choices that simplify things in particular ways. So we could pick the matrix T that puts things in controllable canonical form. Um, there's actually an equivalent to controllable canonical form called observer, observer canonical form. So in controller canonical form, the denominator polynomial coefficients were along the top row. In the observer canonical form, they're along the first column. Um, and again, then and, and the, the roles of B and C are switched. So in the observable canonical, canonical form, C is just 1, 0, 0, 0. And, uh, the B matrix is B1, B2, and so on. There's a, there's a formula in the, the, the slides that you get with this lecture. Um, so we, we're, we're free to pick our coordinate transformation to get a sort of a, a completely equivalent state space representation, but in which the, the modified state space matrices maybe reveal certain nice features. Um, and I encourage you to go away and check this for yourself. But if we look at the transfer function, um, so the transfer function associated with this model is um, C S I minus A inverse B plus D. This is equal to C bar S I minus A bar inverse B bar plus D. And you can check this just using various properties about involving products of matrices and their inverses. Um, but I promise you it's true. The, these two objects are exactly the same. So uh, this coordinate transformation, it doesn't affect the transfer function. It just affects, we, we can just use it to affect A, B, C, and D to make them look nicer. Um, and we're now going to take advantage of that to do a partial fraction uh, decomposition. So this is it's kind of like a slightly weird way to be thinking, um, to be honest. So you 
generally don't want to do partial fraction decompositions of transfer functions. That's a bit of a weird thing to do. You normally want to do partial fraction decompositions of signals, which you then use to, for example, uh, find the inverse Laplace transform. So if you have some big Laplace transform and you want to invert it, you partial fraction expand and then go to a table and look up what the inverses of all the various bits are. So it's a bit weird uh, to do that to a transfer function, but actually, as we already saw, um, the transfer function is nothing but the Laplace domain representation of an impulse response. And an impulse response is really just like a function of time. So you wouldn't ever partial fraction expand a transfer function, but because you can use transfer functions to represent, or you can use ratios of polynomials in the Laplace domain to uh, represent signals, you, that means you could also represent a signal in the Laplace uh, domain by something on this form. And so you could use these techniques to do the partial fraction expansion of that. But kind of just a small point, um, it's not really important. Uh, you don't really know, need to know how to do this um, anyway. But in case that was bothering you, um, why why would we want a partial fraction expand a transfer function? Well, we probably wouldn't, but we could equivalently use this to partial fraction expand something that we did want to partial fraction expand. Um, so how are we going to do this? Well, maybe it's already screaming out at you, but what's another, what's the kind of a common um, decom decomposition that you come across when you study linear algebra that involves a matrix and its inverse turning another matrix into something simpler, well, the eigenvalue decomposition is kind of the classic example. If a matrix has an eigenvalue decomposition, it can be written as t to the minus 1 and then lambda 1 through lambda n. So these are the eigenvalues, and then everything else is 0, and then so T is our matrix of eigenvectors, this is its inverse, and we get uh, diagonal eigenvalues here. And we see straight away, oh, if I pick T to be the eigenvectors of A, and I multiply things in this way, well, T, A, T inverse, that's just going to give me something diagonal. So that's great. So let's just pick T to be the eigenvectors that you get from an eigen decomposition of A. I can get computed to do that. That's no problem. Um, and then, okay, this is going to modify b and c, but b is just a vector of numbers, c is a row vector of numbers. I can also get the computer to work out what t times b and c times t inverse are. Um, we're, not, we're doing things on a board, not on a computer, so I'm just going to say we get the computer to find out what this is, and it gives us just another vector of numbers, beta 1 through beta n. And similarly, C, T inverse, this is another row vector, and I'll call the entries gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma so on, up to gamma n. I forgot to say, that's C, T inverse. So we pick our coordinate transformation, so A is going to be diagonalized, and C and B, they just change to other vectors. We don't care. Computer's doing all the calculations. So... Now let's proceed. So we know that our the th uh, transfer function is this. What happens to our transfer function if we do this change? Well, c bar, that's just gamma 1 through gamma n. And then here, and this is where the advantages are revealed. So si minus a bar, but a bar is going to be just diagonal. So the matrix that's in the inverse is just s minus lambda 1, s minus lambda 2, and so on, s minus lambda n. And we need to inverse this, and we've got zeros everywhere else. So this is a diagonal matrix. And then here we've got beta 1 through beta n, and then we're stuck with d. d didn't get transformed, but that's not a problem. OK, I need to invert this, but it's diagonal, so that's easy. The inverse of a diagonal matrix is just 1 over the diagonal entries. So that's the matrix inverse done. Now if I multiply out this matrix product, what do I get? 
well, this is just equal to gamma 1 beta 1 over s minus lambda 1 plus gamma 2 beta 2 over s minus lambda 2 and so on. And then I've got gamma n beta n over s minus lambda n plus d. And there we go. It's partial fraction expanded already. Um, so just by doing this eigenvalue decomposition, we've found the partial fraction decomposition. And in fact, it was really easy. Once we got our computer to work out what beta 1 to beta n and gamma 1 to gamma n and lambda 1 to lambda n are, well, we've just got this formula now for the partial fraction decomposition. And, well, this is great. Um, there's kind of a small catch here. It relied on our matrix here being diagonalizable. Not all um, matrices have eigenvalue decompositions. The simplest example is um, this matrix here. It doesn't have an eigenvalue decomposition. Um, it does, however, have something that's called a Jordan, um, Jordan decomposition. And in that decomposition, it's got the same structure. We have a matrix T and we've got an invertible matrix T. And it tries to diagonalize things. So if the matrix is, uh, is diagonalizable, its Jordan decomposition is its eigenvalue decomposition. But if the matrix is not diagonalizable, what the Jordan decomposition does is rather than having something diagonal, it instead has something that's block diagonal. And the things on the block diagonal have got very special structure. And actually, we could go through all of the same stuff before, stuff that we did here, except now we have just a bunch of highly structured blocks. And if we wanted, we could also work out what these blocks turned into uh, when, when we um, did the matrix inverse and multiplied things out. So if you want to generalize this to get partial fraction expansions of anything, um, you will have to use the Jordan decomposition. Um, but maybe you can already start to see what these are going to correspond to. I mean, you probably remember from doing your partial fraction decompositions that funny, thing happened, funny things happened when you had repeated poles. Um, so if you had an s plus 1 squared in the denominator of the thing that you wanted to partial fraction expand, quite often you had to do some other annoying rules and you couldn't split everything up into nice first order terms like this. And actually these correspond to the Jordan blocks. So the, the annoying cases when doing partial fraction decompositions by hand correspond to Jordan blocks or correspond to you trying to do something involving matrices that are not diagonalizable. Um, and you can go away and read about this kind of thing on Wikipedia or something if you want. But um, all we wanted to do here was introduce coordinate transformations. It's just a way of changing your state x into something more convenient, uh, z. We pick this in square and invertible matrix however we like. We pick it in such a way that it reveals nice things. Here we showed how to reveal um, this uh, partial fraction, diagonal, nice, easy, inverse kind of structure. Um, but another example is um, the this uh, controllable canonical forms, which allow you to see the connection very clearly with transfer functions, for example. And, we're going to use them in the next lecture to try and understand some extra things about state feedback.